Um, so I'm going to talk about pulmonary recruitment and adequate PEEP titration. And if and they always should go together is the kind of philosophical question. Um, <clears throat> so PEEP, as we know, keeps the alveoli open, but recruitment maneuvers help to open closed alveoli. So in my mind, they have to go together, right? You open alveoli and then you maintain some level of PEEP to keep them open. Um, there are many ways to determine the appropriate PEEP setting for patients. Um, I've listed them here and I'll go through them one by one to talk about the benefits and applications of them. So the first is really looking at the oxygen saturation. Um, for patients with um, very, very mild respiratory disease and or mild um, alveolar collapse, you can turn up the PEEP level and watch what the oxygen saturation does. Um, as you recruit lung parenchyma, um, you'll decrease um, you know, that atelectasis percentage um, and improve your VQ matching, and so therefore your saturation will go up. So it's an easy guide, um, again, for patients with mild um, <clears throat> respiratory failure. So this is really the kind of the basic way that if you, um, again, have a patient who's um, maybe saturations are minimal, 90%, on five of PEEP, you might want to increase it to eight and see what happens. Um, likely it's not to help in patients with very, very severe collapse or patients with very, very poor compliance that going up three centimeters of water of PEEP is not gonna help open the lung. Another very common way is the PEEP FiO2 table is from the ARDSNET study. Um, this looks at lower PEEP, higher FiO2, and then high PEEP and low FiO2 and kind of put them together and matched, you know, certain percentages of FiO2 to certain PEEP levels. Um, I think it's very good. I think it's a safe way to do it if you don't have any other um, more invasively, uh, invasive ways to guide your PEEP titration. I will have to say that um, although the, it seems to be um, philosophically and physiologically accurate, um, there were no studies that um, went along with this that looked at the exact FiO2 to the exact PEEP level and matched it based upon that. It was more of intellectual guidance that paired these two together. Another really um, <laughs> accurate way to get the best PEEP is to do a PV curve. Um, so I would say this is pretty academic in nature, um, probably has minimal clinical application. So you have to disconnect the patient completely from the ventilator, have a large volume syringe with a manometer in line, and as you, you know, inject certain levels of, of gas into the patient, you look where the pressure goes and determine your upper and lower inflection points and then set the PEEP um, higher than that. I think we've all taken care of critically ill patients who would never tolerate this kind of procedure. Um, and <clears throat> so again, it's more um, academic, I think, in nature. Another method of determining the right PEEP level is the stress index assessment. And as you look at the pressure um, time curve when flow is constant, and look at the slope of that, it helps to determine whether or not your PEEP is adequate um, when there's a linear relationship, or you're over or under inflated when there's a downward or upward concavity to that, um, that slope. So how do you get the slope of the line? Um, and I think this, this, um, this assessment is really um, user uh, dependent. So theoretically and practically, you take a straight line, a ruler edge to the ventilator screen, match it up, see you know, if the, the slope kind of curves upward or downward or is flat, and then make your assessment based upon that. So you can understand how different users, different clinicians might get different results by this method. And there are computer programs that you can put in the slope of the line um, or put in the graphics and get the actual slope. Um, but again, it's something that doesn't, doesn't really hold much water. And you understand if you have, <coughs> excuse me, the right peep or the wrong peep, but it doesn't tell you then where to go. So do you go up or down by five or three or two? Um, it doesn't really guide you in any way. So I think a more, um, uh, exact approach is to do a decremental PEEP titration, um, where starting with a higher PEEP and then decreasing the PEEP by certain increments 
and measuring the compliance at each step um, gives you the best compliance um, PEEP where the lung is optimally inflated. So on really high levels of PEEP, you have over distension and the compliance is poor. As you turn that down, you kind of get to what I call the sweet spot where the compliance improves. Um, you understand that your uh, inflation is probably optimal around that point. And as you continue to turn it down further, you induce atelectasis and the compliance again gets poor. So the best PEEP is then based on the best tidal compliance. Uh, I will say that this method does require some time. Um, you have to dedicate um, enough time to make sure the patient equilibrates at each PEEP level to make sure that your measurements are correct. And this was a paper that was published that showed that, um, this was back in uh, 2006, that the decremental PEEP trial with a lung recruitment maneuver um, not only identifies the best PEEP level, but also maintains oxygenation after the procedure is completed. So you don't have this transient increase in your PO2 um, followed by a decrease where you perhaps might have to do some sort of recruitment maneuver or PEEP titration again. Another way to find the right PEEP level is with esophageal manometry. Um, and that looks at um, finding esophageal pressure, which is an analogy of the, the um, pleural pressure, and to find the transpulmonary pressure. So transpulmonary pressure is airway pressure minus pleural pressure. And what you want to make sure is that this transpulmonary pressure is always positive. So the airway pressure is always greater than the pleural pressure to maintain recruitment. So which method is best? Uh, I don't think we quite know that answer. Um, I would say not one size fits all, that a patient with mild disease might respond to um, you know, some sort of um, lower technology approach where you're just increasing um, the PEEP based upon the FiO2. A patient with severe ARDS is not gonna respond to that maneuver and will have to go with more, non -inv uh, more invasive methods. So considering the radiographic evidence of the patient and their presentation um, can help guide you in terms of which method you're going to choose. You also have to consider the comfortability of your care team and those who are working with you. Um, if they're not skilled in esophageal manometry, that's the wrong method to choose. Um, someone has to understand the waveforms, the correct um, placement of that, um, and, and changing the PEEP based upon what you're finding um, to be able to do it accurately. So again, then the large question is the combination of recruitment to open the, uh, the lung and then PEEP to stabilize it. So the whole goal of recruitment maneuvers is to make the lung more homogeneous. I don't think we can ever make it completely the same. Um, inherently, there's different uh, compliance, resistance, time constants in many different regions of the lung. So uh, it will never be 100% the same in each area. But increasing the homogeneity is, is um, the goal of recruitment maneuvers. The other thing is um, if you open the lung um, and maintain it open, you will avoid that cyclic opening and closing that we get during tidal recruitment, which we know puts large amounts of stress on the lung and develops progressive lung damage. There is though a risk benefit analysis that has to be done in doing recruitment maneuvers. So the risk is we actually um, over distend more healthy regions of the lung um, which we know can be, can be bad for the patient, in, um, leading to lung injury. There certainly is um, some hemodynamic compromise for the patients, especially as you wind up collapsing the, um, the vessels, the large vessels coming back to the, the thorax. But the benefit is that you get full lung recruitment. So all of those lung units that may open at higher pressures and stay open, um, perhaps wouldn't be opened if you didn't do a recruitment maneuver. And then kind of on the flip side, you do have this decrease um, in lung injury because you do avoid that tidal recruitment that we were talking about before. So successful re recruitment maneuvers do combine elements of pressure and time. Um, you can't just increase the pressure um, for a short period of time, uh, hoping that lung units will 
open. There has to be some sort of sustained um, time period along with these. There is um, what we call sustained inflation, um, which is increasing the CPAP for some period of time. There are many different applications of this. Um, some do 30 to 50 um, centimeters of water of CPAP for a shorter time of 30 seconds. Some do 40 centimeters for 40 seconds, which I think is a common one that's referred to as the 40-40 approach. Um, and then there's, um, aside from the sustained inflation, there is the pressure controlled approach, where is a stepwise uh, recruitment that increases both the PEEP and the PIP um, over a prolonged period of time. So this is just a graphical representation of the sustained inflation. Um, this has been shown to work well in patients that don't have lung disease, but that have things like uh, their post-op from abdominal surgery. They theoretically have normal lung compliance, normal lung tissue. They just have had atelectasis from external compression during surgery. So you can um, use the sustained inflation, reopen those lungs, and then maintain the PEEP at the same level that you were before because those lung units are theoretically healthy. The pressure controlled approach, um, again, looks at increasing both the PEEP and the PIP in stepwise fashion. Um, and then maintaining, as you can see here, a higher level of PEEP um, after you do the recruitment maneuver to maintain inflation. So what about the routine use of recruitment maneuvers? Is that helpful or not? Um, this was a, a meta-analysis that was published um, about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, where recruitment maneuvers were neither recommended nor forbidden um, but should be used really on a case-by-case -case basis. The more the severe hypoxemia, the likelihood that you should do recruitment and that it will be beneficial is, is higher. Um, recruitment maneuvers should be used um, when there's a clinical change in the patient or a prolonged disconnect from the ventilator. Um, and they recommended that it should be coupled with an, a PEEP evaluation. So doing a recruitment maneuver for someone that has respiratory failure and lung disease, um, and then you, know, you identify that you need this recruitment maneuver to open some alveoli, if you then return the PEEP to the same level, over a period of time, those alveoli are going to collapse again because you, you identify the recruitment maneuver was because those lung areas were closed on that first level of PEEP. So, um, about five years ago, there was um, a pro-con debate about whether recruitment maneuvers should be used um, in patients with lung injury and ARDS. Um, the pro was that that cyclic opening and closing we know is harmful to lung units, especially those um, lung units that are more healthy in nature. The mortality for ARDS is very high, and so if we can um, help decrease that by opening more lung units, improving gas exchange, the better. There is uh, a sustained uh, lung function Im improvement in lung function following recruitment maneuvers. We know that the oxygenation is better. We know that the compliance of the lungs is better. We know that there's um, less pressure needed for the same volume, um, and there's better distribution of that volume throughout the lung regions. And there's minimal risk if they're um, performed in a timely manner. Um, and properly uh, with the correct um, risk, I guess, um, interventions, meaning we know that the patient's probably going to get hypotensive. So we need to make sure that there's, um, you know, various methods of intravenous fluid administration or vasopressors available um, to help the patient through that acute period. The con is that this repeated injury, this repeated um, and overinflation, um, that shear stress in the lung um, is likely to cause further lung damage for those units that, um, again, are healthy. So the recruitment maneuvers are trying to target those lung units that are diseased, but um, we then have this secondary effect on the lung units that are, have a better compliance in that they get um, severely overdistended. There is no um, data that shows recruitment maneuver um, either increase or decrease the morbidity and mortality of patients. 
Um, and again, we've talked that the most effective way is not clear. There's no, um, no defined way to do this. It's really based upon the clinical presentation of the patient and uh, what your care team is, is comfortable with. The selection criteria is also unclear and the risks are unclear. Um, I think we've probably all taken care of those patients where um, we didn't think that they would have such hemodynamic compromise um, and we're surprised to see uh, what effects they had from a recruitment maneuver. So there was a randomized control trial done um, back in 2017 where they looked at um, low PEEP for the control arm and then recruitment maneuver plus PEEP titration um, for the experimental arm. And um, the primary outcome was mortality at uh, 28 days. So the experimental arm um, certainly had higher mortality, um, but I think it's important to note that um, there were some things that were done in the exper experimental arm, including um, the approach to recruitment and the approach to PEEP titration, um, that kind of lead us to suspect um, that it probably wasn't as we do clinically. For example, the recruitment maneuver was done um, with 45 centimeters of water of PEEP, which actually induced cardiac arrest in several patients. So halfway through the study, they actually altered um, the experimental arm of the study where the recruitment maneuvers were done with significantly less PEEP um, because they saw that that 45 centimeter of water um, was certainly developed um, and induced some risks for the patients. As well as in the experimental arm, um, there were minimal changes in tidal volumes post-recruitment. Um, and so what that kind of leads us to believe is that there were, was no recruitable lung parenchyma and so that really doesn't fall under, um, you know, a, a true application for recruitment maneuvers. So in conclusion, uh, recruitment maneuvers certainly help with uh, reversing atelectasis. They eliminate the different differences in various lung regions to make the lung more homogeneous. Um, but in doing so, we may actually injure the more healthy lung. So we know that routine and repeated recruitment maneuvers are dangerous and that evaluation of PEEP should occur um, in combination with recruitment. If you feel like you have some sort of atelectasis on X level of PEEP, um, doing a recruitment maneuver to open those alveoli and returning back to that same level of PEEP um, doesn't make a lot of sense um, physiologically. Uh, you need to, you know, um, Place the patient on higher levels of PEEP if you feel recruitment maneuvers are necessary. There are various ways to do it. Um, there's no defined best way in the literature. Um, you know, it has to be based upon the patient that's in front of you as well as the care team that you're working with to determine uh, which level you should, uh, which method you should choose. Any questions?